Welcome to the Gentleman's Talk, where the podcast talks about a man's battle with mental health, his personal experiences, and his journey to be a better soul. Hosted by James Dean Littlejohn. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Gentleman's Talk. Um, how are we? Hope you're okay. I really enjoyed yesterday's podcast. Went live. Um, sort of really got into the mode of things and um, wasn't sure if I was going to come on today, to be fair, because I had a week off. Um, I got straight back into it and a good podcast yesterday, and but it's obviously exhausted me from... I'm still feeling those after effects from that dreaded COVID, the tiredness, you know? Uh, let me just puff this down a little bit, just so we don't answer loud. Um, yeah, I wasn't really going to talk um, because I thought I was tired. However, I had an interesting scenario today. Um, so much so that I really wanted to talk about it because I didn't know whether I've overthought the situation. You know, have I been a bit of a dickhead and how I've, I've reacted? Um, and I've also got four different views um, on the scenario that happened today. Now, let me explain this scenario. So here it is. I, I've come back into work and... Um, no mention of no names, no organisations, nothing like that. Just showing you the things that I've I've sort of I deal with, you know. And I went to work, had my return to work from from being off. You know, it's the it's a compliant compulsory thing to do now, isn't it? Um, that went okay, not the best. Um, you know, sort of kind of half seven in the morning, and the the boss is making you know sort of funny jokes and stuff. Um, yeah. Anyway, by the by, I didn't take that too sensitively. Um, Anyway, so we, we moved on. Uh, that was it. We'd done our quick brief. It was the return to work catch up. We did what we needed to do. We moved on and, uh, you know, get on with your day sort of thing. And then as a the sort of morning progressed, but only about an hour, I think it was about, in fact, yeah, it was about an hour later, just before I was going on to a, a another meeting. Um, my boss um, rung me on my, on my mobile, which is a bit unusual because I thought, well, we've got... Um, other means of communication, you know, social media, so, not social media, um, Skype or Teams or whatever we use, whatever platform we decide to use. Um, so I just thought nothing of it, took took the call. I was on a call to a friend at the time anyway, so paused him, cracked on with the call. Now, I'll give you a little bit of context. So there'll be a bit of to and fro in here, so bear with me just so you understand. I want you to understand my point of view um, and then give you the feedback I've received from from different age groups and from different background groups as well um, when I've spoken to them about this. Um, anyway, so I joined my organisation um, last year. So I told you at 40 I was going to make that conscious effort to retrade, retrain my mind, get into a completely new trade at 40-year-old. It was, it was an ambition. I said I wanted to do it. So I've worked absolutely tirelessly, and I genuinely mean, I'm not, again, I'm not looking for sympathy or big-headedness, any flat, but I have put some bloody hours into my education. I've probably done more education on myself in this last year than I have in my lifetime, and that goes from school. It's, I have been that engaged. I have done so many courses to upskill myself to better myself, to give me a really, really advanced knowledge base to, so that when I go in to get the experience, the experience comes easy. So I kind of took that conscious decision. I've also spent in, in excess of about £6,000 on this education. So, you know, right up to level six in health and safety. So I've been invested and, and I've worked evenings, I've worked weekends. You know, I, I told you I've moved back home. So I've sacrificed a lot still because I wanted to better myself. I want the second part of my life, shall we say, if we want to break it down, um, and if I live to, to 80. <laughs> but I wanted the second half of my life to be more lucrative, more fun, and I wanted to almost be able to enjoy my retirement. So I'd already had pensions and stuff. I'm a little bit, I was a little bit savvy with it. You know, I'd still, I still, I took on the right organisations from a young lad. So I managed to try and secure that pension and, you know, that little safety net when I'm a bit older but I've taken it one step further and, I, and like I said I, I joined this organization last year and then through this last year with them I have worked tirelessly to upskill myself until on the year 
I moved organisations to to a different role, and it was a significant um, a significant grade jump, if you like. So almost going from a, a a lower level person right up to senior management in one jump, which was about three grades, I think it was. Um, and I'd done that because I could prove myself. I could I I, I practiced my um, interview skills. I did the application form down to a T, you know, followed all of the guidance that was out there on the internet. I spent almost six hours doing my application. And now one person who I told today did went, six hours, what? I was like, to get it right, to get the right words in, to, you know, make the application seem as presentable as possible, but not shoot myself in the foot because I'm an honest person. So I've never lied on my applications. If I don't get the job through what I've achieved then I didn't deserve the job. And if they, they were obviously looking for something different. So I've, I've never, ever looked at it negatively when I, you know, go to the point where... Um, hold on. Let's just turn the music down again. It was a bit distracting for me, that was. Sorry. Um, I've never really kind of gone... I just kind of went all, all in, really. I just went, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to change this. So I've, and I spent, like I said, I spent hours on the application form tirelessly searching the internet looking for the right words the right words that I could go to an interview confidently that I've practiced I didn't know what the question sets were going to be but I've looked at my history and my knowledge and my experience and you know I did everything as per the direction the guidance is out there for using so I did and I've spent a lot of time and a lot of time on myself and a lot of time on ensuring that I'm I'm successful and also ensuring that I can get through the process confidently without bullshitting. We all know that we sometimes stretch our CVs and sometimes we elaborate on the interviews to try and get through that. But that's that's fine. Uh, my personal experiences from that, um, people that have done that, I've never done it. And I, and I genuinely mean I've never done it. I've always put down exactly what I've done. Yes, we can manipulate wording to make it sound a little bit better, but that's just face value stuff. I've not kind of gone, yeah, I was the, you know, CEO of fucking Tesla. Do you know what I mean? I've never done that. So, I, you know, I'm CEO of Tesla. I literally ran it. Elon, you know, I haven't, but there is people that will do that. And I've had people, I've employed people that have done that and given it the big licks. And I can hand on heart say that even in recent years, three out of the five people that I recruited for one organization were clearly lying on their CV, clearly lying. So they got found out, and it's egg on their face, you know? So, but that's fine. That's that's their process. That's, if they want to do that, then they go ahead and do that. It's their, it's their process. It's their life. It's their path. So if they get found out, they lose a job, they move on. I don't want that. I want security. I want someone to, I want to be employed on my merit, skills, and knowledge and experience. That's all I want. If you want me... Um, and my personality shines through, then, you know, by all means, happy days. I've, I've done it successfully, and I've done it on my own back. Um, I have never had help in any of my job roles. I've always done it on my own. I've always gone through the process on my own, and I've always been successful on my own. I've worked for everything. So I was a bit gobsmacked, and, and, and I gave you, I'm trying to give you a bit of a background there, because I was a bit gobsmacked, a bit taken back, actually. So on the basis of that, just to give you a bit of a background on the amount of time I'd spent getting into this organisation and doing everything appropriately, um, I was contacted by my boss and um, he he openly asked me if I could send him my application and CV because it was so good and I was obviously successful um, that he wants to ensure that the other people, which included him, actually, um, got the next job, the, the, the roles. They were, they were just temporarily taken over the roles. Now, straight away, I was like, oh, yeah, OK, you know, a little bit taken back on the phone. And I was on the phone, I was on, the, on a Skype call anyway. I was a bit taken back and I was like, yeah, yeah, OK. And anyway, I sort of put the Skype call down and the phone call down and then I sit and mulled it over and it didn't sit right with me. And I sat there for an hour going, I don't know whether to be complimented. Is that a compliment? Yes, of course it is. He wants to use my stuff to advance. He's going for something above me and still wants to use my, you know, skills and, and, and um, 
my writing skills, et cetera, et cetera. So, but I, t- I took it as a compliment, but that compliment only came when someone highlighted it, actually, because I didn't take that. I took the view. Um, now, bearing in mind, some people, when they go into roles, they shouldn't be in roles. That's the easiest way to say it, you know? So as I went back, we allude back to people might stretch their application, shall we say. So I didn't want to be privy part of any of that because, number one, I have a, a code of conduct. And number two, I have a moral compass in the sense that I took it as an offence initially because I was like, what the fuck, mate? You want to use my hard work to make, you know, potentially three people get through the door, you know, or, or give them that, that, that slight advantage. Now, morally, I know that's wrong because that's not open and fair competition, is it? So morally, I was there. You know, I was, you know, I wasn't comfortable with it. And then, obviously, from the organisation's perspective, I had to look at it from that. I had to take a pragmatic approach to it. And I went, well, if if this ever got found out, for instance, and they'd used it and just basically changed my name, which, let's be honest, nine times out of ten, that's what most people do. They change a couple of words. But you still, you can't change the context of it by changing a couple of words. It will still read the same. You might change a couple of apps and a couple of thus but you can't change it without inputting just a couple of like your name and a couple of little extra bits changing the scenario but it will still read the same so I was like if we're going through the sifting process and this is highlighted and then they look at mine and go that's very very close then I could be done for breaching code of conduct and giving an unfair advantage to somebody so I'm then going to feel the the burn massively there and I always do look at the worst case scenario I have to because I've done stupid shit in my life and I've made stupid mistakes that I haven't thought about the worst case scenario so for me I have to remember the worst case scenario and I have to look at it and I am I have done a lot of research and I always look and I always you know join an organization I'll read their code of conduct down to down to a T so I understand what it is okay bit of a brain box there you know bit of a bit of a geek but I do that because I don't want to step on the wrong feet I want to be comfortable in my job knowing that I'm doing the right things at the right time I don't want to make that mistake and just get you know fired for you know something that could have been massively and very easily avoided so I, I had that moral compass, and it didn't sit right with me. It really doesn't. I still get a bit offended now, because I just thought the cheek of it, mate. I've worked hard, and it, on, on the back of that, they were like, yeah, we're going to support and, and give, like, you know, a little bit of support here and there, you know, we'll give some fucking interview stuff. And, and I was like, I, I don't get this, mate. I didn't get that help, and I got the fucking job. If you don't have that skill set to get sifted or get through the interview, then to me personally, who's worked fucking hard and seen a lot of people get given fucking jobs, and I get that that there's a necessity and there's a reason, and if I was given a job, I probably wouldn't be as offended because I'd be like, fucking bonus. So I'm playing devil's advocate on my side here, and I'm trying to give you my feelings, not so much as I will always look at both sides of the picture. And hence the reason why I said, if I was on the receiving foot of being given this help, and if I was on the receiving foot of, you know, being offered a job, would I take it? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. But I've never been in that situation in 27 years of working. I have never, ever been in that situation. I've been fucking let down from jobs that have been offered to other people with less skills than me. Um you know at the same level so i've i've endured a pretty it's made me the person i am so this is the this is the positive on that it's made me the person i am it's made me appreciate the process and the reward for going through the process and getting the job is amazing i know for a fact i can sit here hand on fucking heart and say i helped i did it I didn't I wasn't helped I did it I did it on my own my own merit skills experience the interview process the grueling panel interview process I sat that and I took the questions these three people failed that and they didn't get through so now I'm being asked to guide them through so well I didn't get that guide and I haven't been supported in th- the three months I've been here so why should I do that so 
And there is a caveat to this, because I'm not an arsehole. So anyway, I that just didn't sit right with me today, and it felt I felt a bit uncomfortable, I'm going to be honest, because it put me in a bit of a predicament, um, especially at the grade I'm at. You, I couldn't plead ignorance. I couldn't turn around and say, yeah, I didn't know, or, oh, I'm sorry, slap on the wrist, I was just helping out. Because they'll look at me and they'll go, you're, you're in a senior manager's position, mate. You must know that's not right. So I had to, I had to look at that. I have to protect myself. It's my journey. It's my path. I've earned it. I'm not here to, I'm not here to make other people's lives easier. I want them to earn their own merits. <clears throat> now, I'm not telling them to do that. I'm not forcing them to earn their own merits. I'm not standing on the moral high ground. I am a little bit, but I'm not trying to. Because I did caveat that, and this is where the caveat came in. So when I, you know, when I emailed my boss afterwards, because I had to email because I wanted, the, I wanted the chain that he's asked me, and this is my fucking response. I don't care how you want to do it. I do things properly, mate, because I don't want to get bitten in the arse. I don't want to be sitting there trying to explain myself and trying to defend my job. I don't want to be doing that. I just want to come in, do my job, go home, get paid, spend time with my family and friends. That's all I want to do. A job to me used to be my world. Now it is you get fucking paid, you do your job, go home. That's it. You know, I, I'm not invested in companies anymore because they don't invest back in me. So that's a personal bit of bitterness. But at the same time, it's just the way it's gone. So I just do. But then I do 110% in those hours and I achieve a more, more. At the moment, I'm doing three jobs and I've been in this job for three months um, and I'm doing three senior jobs already. And I'm being given all of the work for three senior jobs. Now, so that's where I say I do give a lot when I'm in work. But when that clock off time comes in, I'm out, mate. I'm Duncan Valentine and I'm done. So I did caveat. So I sent him an email and I said to him, you know, I didn't feel comfortable. Uh, I don't and I didn't see how my personal knowledge and experience will help someone else because my scenario is based around my experiences so I don't get what you were going to gain from looking at my work, is what I said. And But I did say, please, I don't want to, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not being, um, you know, stick, stuck, you know, stuck in the mud here, just sticking them. I'm not being the, the, you know, the out and out idiot here. I just, what I will do, though, is I will offer advice from the guidance that I learnt from, which is available to everybody. And I will sit in an open forum and I will help them to put, the words in the right structure to assist them because half the time that's what it is you've got the skill set if you're going for that job then nine times out of ten you've got the skill set for it you just need to articulate that in your wording to make it look like you're comfortable and confident um that can be easily learned as well you know so i understand that the the process for employment can be a bit of a difficult one can be a bit of a stickler and sometimes you know, you can get um, you can get torn apart by the by the you know the policies and the and the and the politics, as I call it. Of it, you can do. It's it's not it's it's, it's inevitable. You are going. It's it's a hard, it's a horrible process employing sometimes. And I've been on both sides. I've been on the interviewer side and I've been on the interviewee side. So you know, I've done both sides of things. So I'm very comfortable in how they go. Um, so I've always been slightly confident with those sort of things. So it's never really worried me, but I can see how they can be like that. So I even phoned the, the one of the guys and said, look, mate, you know, what have you got so far for your structure? Can I help you out? Um, and I got a bit of a frosty reception, if I'm honest, from him. I think because I said I just don't feel comfortable sending this, which would have impacted him directly anyway. And I said, I just don't feel comfortable, mate. I'm so sorry, but I will help you through it. And then when I messaged him later on, uh, you know, sort of asking him what time, you know, interviews and all that were, um, I didn't get a response. So I thought, well, he's obviously taken now offence to me not helping him. Now, I can't help but feel saddened by that because I've worked hard to get to where I am. I've turned my life around. I'm making these leaps and bounds. It's not as if you can't find the information because I found the information whilst I was nothing to do with the organisation. I just did a bit of research and I almost got to the point where I was like, you've known these jobs roles are coming up for about two months. So why haven't you put a little bit of time into this? Do you know what I mean? And it was almost as if, can you put it on the plate? Cause we've got it in a couple of days and I ain't really got the time now. Um, you did really fucking well. Can you help them prep? 
and can you do this? And I'm like, I don't want to. I can help them verbally to talk through their own scenarios and I'll do that by all means. But I'm not physically giving you my CV in question set. And see, because he was like, he, he openly said, he, my boss openly said, you were fucking brilliant. And, you know, and I went, oh, I take that as a compliment, mate. I really appreciate that. I've worked hard to get here. So I sent him that and I didn't get a response. And I was like, right, so I'm in a bit of a fucking shit. So I feel like the arsehole and I, I shouldn't feel like that arsehole. I shouldn't be the person that gets like is, is getting emotional. I've had anger and sadness in, in one scenario. And all I wanted to do was wake up this morning and do my job and fucking go home. That was it. I just wanted to do that. And then I'm put in a, in a bit of a predicament. And now I've got a frosty reception from two people because what? I didn't gift them the job. I don't know them from Adam. Do you know what I mean? I don't know who they are. You know, yeah, we've had a couple of meetings and we spoke a couple of times, but that doesn't mean I need to invest in a year's worth of hard work for you. Now, that was my view. Um, But again, just remember, I did caveat it with I was willing to give up my time to have an open forum discussion um, and and run through their own scenario, their own question set and their own, um, you know, uh, answers and just make them sound better. I was willing to do that. And I, and I got chinned off because, guess what? It's not the fucking easy route, is it? So I felt a bit sort of saddened by that, if I'm honest. And it's played on my mind to the point where I spoke 21 minutes about it and I ain't even finished. So I then moved on and, and um, yeah, I went, to, I went up to see a friend. And, um, oh, no, that was it. I, I, I spoke to two people very close to me, family, and um, asked them both. And now they're... You know, they're both, of you know, male gender and female gender. So they give me two completely opposite. Well, they were similar. Um, one person took the approach of that's fucking awful, uh, full on protection mode, if you like. Um, and the other person took on the take it as a compliment. And that's where I first heard it. Take it as a compliment that he's asked you, but you can't do that. It's just not right. You know, you're, you've offered your services, you've been polite, but you just can't do that. It goes against everything. You know, you're, that goes against the whole open and fair competition, doesn't it? And, and I don't feel comfortable with that because that person that might come along might actually be legitimate and deserve the job exactly like me, like I was. So I worked hard. I, des- I got through. And so I felt ch- I felt chuffed with that. Um, I don't feel that people should just get it granted or handed to them. I just, it just don't fucking sit right with me. Anyway, so I move on. So I spoke to them two and, and they gave me mixed emotions. Both of them thought it was a very negative thing to do though. Don't do it, wasn't right. But one did say, um, one took more of the, remember you're in a senior position and look at the impact that could have if you get, if it gets found out. And the other person took the, take it as a compliment, but just, you know, nicely let them down. So then I went, um, I went up and, and I went to see a friend actually and, st- and as I was seeing that friend just while I was waiting for him I bumped into another friend so it's been a bit of a busy day so I would say um, however he, he, the, the, per- the second person I bumped into not really well acquainted with him know him can talk to him open talk to him openly not openly openly but you know how are you and family and all that sort of stuff so we knew each other but you know I wouldn't go telling him my intimate secrets you know what I mean I, w- I certainly wouldn't tell him even about my mental health probably because it doesn't need to know he's not close enough really for me to to be of an impact to him and I didn't see I don't see a longevity of future uh, uh, that friendship it was you know it's one of those we all people are always in and out of your life aren't they but I told him the scenario and um he said to me wow you're a bit fucking cutthroat aren't you and I went what do you mean and he was like well, fucking hell, you're not going to help someone out. I was like, yeah, I am willing to help them out. I'm not willing to give them the right answers. That's the that's the difference there. So he took the, and then he said to me, no, I still think that's really fucking cutthroat. In quite a, like a disgusted manner, it felt to me. But I don't think he meant it. Not like that, certainly. But I could see there was an air of that about it. And I went, well, it's fine, mate. I said, it's a, it's a cutthroat world out there, mate. I said, nobody's given me the answers. Nobody's given it to me on a plate. I've worked through. I've had the knockbacks. I've had the disappointment in my courses. I've failed some courses. You know, I've had the failure. The failure makes you stronger. Get it on a plate doesn't make you stronger. You're just a fucking weak person. That's in, in, you're a weaker person in a role. And you'll, you'll probably be s- sort of sinking before you swim unless you're on the ball. Some people can get straight into it. 
And I commend those people. I have been there. I've gone into roles. I, I was chucked my last site manager role at last minute. Uh, and luckily, I'd, you know, I had been in the, I had been in the trade for 20 years at the time. So I've, I knew it, you know, like the back of my hand. But for me personally, it just didn't sit right with me, this, this whole scenario, the way I was being approached. And I just thought, well, you know, if, if my boss wants to, or my potential boss, shall we say, wants to use my information, then why don't I go for the job? Because clearly I can do it. You know what I mean? So it's like, there's a double-edged sword there then. And I'm starting to think, well, actually, if you're coming to me for this information, I'm then going to apply for the job then, aren't I? Do you know what I mean? And it's like, it's a very difficult situation. It's put me in a bit of a... But anyway, so I had that negative. And then I spoke to a, my good friend, um, <clears throat> who I, I've actually caught up with. And um, I don't know. I I told him the scenario. He could see it from my point of view. Um, but I do think that he appeased me. You know, I, I think he appeased me. I don't think he really gave me the view. I actually think that his view was potentially a little bit like the other friend I spoke to. You know, a little bit like it's a bit cutthroat, you know. And I see that because... We all need helping through life. Um, but I caveat it with the particular person who asked me, which is my potential boss, has also called me stupid, um, has also ignored my emails, has also not given me any information, any structure or any focus in, in that sort of sense, any purpose to my role. So there's been a... I'm just sat there like, you know, and I'm not, you know, I'm not berating him, not belittling him at all. Um, what I mean is it's, it works both ways. And I don't feel that that was a reciprocated relationship. You know, I don't think that was a, a you know, a sort of that, that wasn't a, that sort of kind of camaraderie. Do you know what I mean? There wasn't that there for, I didn't feel that the structure there with the person I've only recently known was in a situation where you could ask that, you know, it was, I thought it was a bit cheeky. Um, so anyway, I told this friend and, uh, you know, yeah, he he gave me the words I wanted to hear, I think. And I don't truly think that he told me his true opinion of what I said. Um, hopefully he'll listen to this and maybe, maybe think I did think it was a bit harsh, you know, um, which is fine. That's how that's how I I've been dealt the rough the rough card and I'm not saying oh god you know make it easy for me now because I don't want it easy in actual fact I like the hard path because the hard path is worthwhile the the hard path is you know it, it it's it's the most rewarding path you can take I'm a better person I'm a better manager I've grown in knowledge through those knockbacks those setbacks have all given me drive it's taken me and bearing in mind I've been working with PTSD and depression and I've been getting those knockbacks during them and I've managed to fight through that fight through the depression and the anxiety of it and the kind of feeling of sort of lack of self-worth I've felt all of that do you know what I mean I've felt every single emotion that has been there for being knocked back or looking at my application form process and seeing application unsuccessful or not getting anything back from interviewers. I've been there completely and utterly. So I don't want people to take the easy path as much as I can. I will, but like I said, I've caveated it with the fact that I was willing to help them verbally. It was just that physical handing over of information. So it'd be interesting to know what you think, really. It'd be interesting to know what your thoughts are on that. Was I a backside arsehole? You know, was I... Um, was I taking it from? Was I taking it too personally because of the way I've been treated? Now the question to look out there, um, or was I within my rights to say, you know, yeah, I'm not willing to give you the work, but I'm willing to assist you. I'm willing to sit down in an open forum and discuss with you, help you that way. Then we can both learn from the process. I can learn a bit more about you, and I can help you learn a bit more about yourself too. So. I, there would have been a lot more out of that process. That's how I looked at it. As well as, you have to remember, when we cast our mind back to the start of the podcast, where the repercussions, if something did happen, is, is you know, it's quite damning. You know, if you get caught plagiarism, you get caught of going against codes of conduct, it's, 
it's not a simple, you know, slap on the wrist. It's probably, you know, your tribunal kick out, do not pass, go. Uh, and that's not what I want. I've worked hard to get where I am, and that's why I am a little bit selfish because I don't owe anybody anything, but I can guarantee people owe me some things, but I don't, I don't call those in. I don't call them because I don't want to call those in. That's not what life's about. I do things for the love of it. So if I want to help you, I will help you. I will, undiv- I will give you my undivided attention, but there's a way of doing it. And that's just not the way that it should be done. But anyway, they're the three little scenarios. Love to hear <clears throat> some feedback before I break into my topic for today. Um, love to hear some feedback on that little scenario. It's, it was quite, like I say, I felt a lot of emotions from that. Um, you know, I was complimented. I felt humbled that I'm being, you know, asked by three different people to assist them, which means, you know, I've worked hard and it's been worthwhile. But also I felt it was a bit cheeky. You know, I don't, if it had been a friend, somebody I was a close friend with, undivided attention wouldn't even question it. Somebody that was in my little inner circle, undivided, wouldn't even question it. I will absolutely, absolutely give you, you know, all of my support. I've sat down recently and done a, um, helped my daughter with her art class. And she's pulled out of that from, from getting a A in art for it. Because I've helped her all the way. I didn't do it for her. I showed her the process. She enjoyed it, and art was in the eye of the beholder. But <clears throat> all I did was help her envision the artwork and do something a little bit out of the box, you know? So we took it to a different level, so she saw a different side of art, and she also felt a little bit of the creative juices, you know, that sort of kind of can, fl- that can flow, you know? Because as I said to my friend this morning, my dear friend this, morning, uh, this afternoon when I met up with him, I was like, and I told him about the thing with my daughter and showed him the picture, and he was like, wow. And I went... I said, I, art is an amazing thing, but, you know, it is, it's not, not everybody has it. Not everyone has that skill. Things can be learned, but you you do need an element of that je ne sais quoi, you know, that little bit of flair, you know, you have to, to understand, to visualise something past. Some artwork's fucking ridiculous, um, but again, it's not my vision of art, so we all have different visions of art. You might not be artistically minded, but you might actually be looking at, something a different way to me well that's an artistic way of looking at life but you just need to coax it out of people and create get their creative flow in you know creativity sort of burn it you know sort of sort of infuse it to the top and get it going so i'm willing to help people everybody i'm willing to help anybody but there's a way of doing it there's a way of doing it for me so interesting i'd love to hear your you know your thoughts and thoughts and processes on that if possible stick it in the thread stick it on the facebook page or um you know write it on the write it on the pod um there's a there's a messenger server in pod in in podbean that i can re, i can sort of reply to anyway <clears throat> i'm going to break into before i sort of kind of drone on too much oh god james you're droning on <clears throat> um i want to get into something that i have felt a lot and this is what i feel after a high after a after a weekend spending time with close family or friends, <clears throat> this is what I feel. But I recognise I feel this now, and and but it's something I used to feel all the time. And what is that, James? What are you bumbling on about? Emotional exhaustion <clears throat> is what I'm bumbling on about. What is emotional exhaustion, James? Well, I can tell you. I'll tell you what I think it is. Emotional exhaustion is that. F- feeling isn't it you get of being emotionally worn out drained you might have massive personal stress you might have work life stress you might even have a combination of both of those but emotional exhaustion is it's just one of those signs that you're burning yourself out and what happens when you burn yourself out all sorts anger emotions you know that feeling of being stuck or trapped and you know my life I haven't got my life under control there's no power in my life you know those are the sort of emotions that can be triggered triggered with emotional exhaustion and feeling stuck and feeling trapped and I remember this actually I can cast my mind back to I phoned my doctor up about a year after I'd been diagnosed with um, depression and I said to him can I see you and he was like 
yes, of course, James, made an appointment, went down, had a 15-minute appointment. And I looked at him and went, I don't know what to do. I, I feel stuck. I feel trapped. And he said to me, well, what are your goals, James? And I went, well, I don't know, mate. I can't fucking focus past tomorrow, let alone look at what a goal is. And he said to me, you need a goal. You need something to look forward to. You need that goal. If it's a small win or a big win, if it's a, I want to get promoted in five years, so I'm going to work tirelessly, not tirelessly, I'm going to work towards that. I want to go on holiday in two years, so I'm going to do what I can to go on that holiday. You know, you might have those things, but they're the goals that can help you. But at the same time, to feel stuck and trapped in that life situation is a horrible feeling that is all promoted from stress. And that's one of the common denominators in men. And it all depends on your personality, it all depends on your outlook, depends on how that depression can manifest, how it can consume your thoughts. I keep talking about the, the brain fog, and that's what I've what I've spoken about with regards to my view of depression. It's a fog over your face, it's over your eyes, it's constantly you, you never see it anything if you if you can imagine going up to the mountains and you're you're you know i don't know wales or somewhere like that the width the, you know you've looked at it and it's an absolutely beautiful valley and you've got a lake in the middle um and i reflect this because i've been to the welsh valleys actually and i've taken a photo in, within two hours of each other and anyone that's been to to wales military probably all the time um, but if you've been there recreationally or you've walked the mountains, you'll understand what I mean. You can take a photo and an hour later you can have a completely different photo. And that's what this was. I, I relate to depression as that fog. It's You've looked at life, life's amazing, and then all of a sudden you've got a fog over your face and everything's grey and you get shimmers of light potentially depending on your mood swing. But ultimately everything's dull, everything's misty you know you've got that kind of you don't know what's in front of you and we allude to that I've alluded to that in a previous podcast where you know well how do you get over something like that well you don't focus on the you know if you can only see one step in front of you then just focus on that step and that's a coping mechanism to deal with that and this is what I've been trying to nurture with all of you is giving you life scenarios putting things into context and showing you how to get out of them or potentially move forward that's what it's about don't look at you know if I was going to caveat that that view of depression with how to deal with it is don't focus on the 10 steps focus on the one step focus on the one you can see then when you're strong enough to visually see and that fog is lifting you'll take bigger steps billy big steps as i call them but emotional exhaustion is that lack of energy poor sleep you get decreased motivation it can be difficult to overcome emotional exhaustion and then what happens is that then over time turns into chronic, like depression, you're in a, cr or a, cr a chronic stressed out state, which then causes permanent damage to your health. I know for a fact that all of these headaches I'm, that I get now are, are triggered, in, they're triggered instantly. And they're all from stress because I, I've manifested stress so much that when I get that spout of stress, like I've had it today, I've been stressed about this situation, I've had a fucking headache all afternoon, because I'm stressed, because morally I didn't want to, you know, like I said, morally I didn't want to give my information away, but at the same time, the kind person in me wanted to give the thing away, and go, yeah, yeah, fucking get in, let's make it easy for you, you know, part of me wanted to, because I'm a nice fucking guy, that's a horrible thing, I don't like being horrible, I hate it actually, I hate letting people down, so you, you're, you're breaking into that emotional exhaustion, you know, and, and that causes permanent damage. And I know I've had this 10 years I've been having migraines. I've tried everything. And, you know, even one of the point when I'm with copious amounts of people and there's loads of no, noise going on, I still get triggered. And I, that becomes really relevant when I'm socialising now. And I've seen that more and more. Like, I've, I can't relax. There's so much going on when I'm, when I'm drinking. And, I've, and it happened on Friday. I had to... Um, I had to take medication because I was sat there and I had music in my background. I had the music being changed constantly um, because we were all listening to different music, but we weren't listening to a full song. We were talking, we had a commotion going on anyway, and we were drinking, and it overwhelmed me. By, by four or five hours in, I was consumed. You know, so 
I still get those problems. They're still chronic. And that's why I said they cause permanent damage. And 10 years is permanent damage. I know that's why I've got permanent. But anyone experiencing this long-term stress can become emotionally exhausted, even overwhelmed. And everything just becomes difficult. Just normal, easy, everyday tasks can become difficult. It, it, you know, you could be... I, to give you a prime example, I used to... And I've said this again in podcasts, this is all about it. You know, I, I used to focus on work that much that when I get to Thursday, because I was so focused at doing 14-hour days, because that's what I thought I needed to do, that by Thursday I was drained. I didn't, for, for years, I couldn't go out because I'm so exhausted. I remember my wife at the time saying to me, why are you so tired? And it was that emotional exhaustion, and it used to creep up to me. Even though that it was happening all the time, I never put a pattern on it. I never said, well, fucking hell, must be something wrong here, James, because I was so deep involved so it used to creep up on me. I used to be getting there. And Thursday afternoon, I used to get to about one o'clock on a Thursday. And I'd go, I've done my fucking hours nearly, but I am going home. I am fucking bollocks. And no one ever used to think I was being a bit, probably thought I was a bit lazy. Uh, why is he going home? Fucking how's he doing? And I was like, I'm emotionally exhausted, mate. I am absolutely physically drained. And one of the things, like, I, 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 wrote, this, I wrote this bit down. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wrote this bit down because one of the things I, I try to explain in these podcasts is I try to give you what the signs are for certain things. So I did a bit of research, and I can fully relate to literally nearly all of these, to be fair. Um, and they relate similarly to the same experiences you get with PTSD and the same rhetoric with with um, you know anxiety and um, depression. This is mental health doesn't it it doesn't change what the abilities are we still you know it just depends you might not get all of these symptoms they might create but emotional exhaustion can manifest at the start of something and then just grow into other things so if i you know i'll give you some some examples here so some normal signs will be lack of motivation well okay we all get a little bit of lack of motivation but we're talking about prolonged periods of lack of uh, motivation lack of it trouble sleeping which is a big thing with mental health, and I suffer from that all the time, it is mind-blowingly horrendous. When you've had one or two hours sleep, and I used to focus, I used to literally function on one or two hours sleep, and I did that for a couple of years a night, because that's what I did, and that's when I used to crash out. So I would just focus on one or two hours, I would get to Thursday, I'd crash out for about 12 hours, and then I'd go again for the weekend, and then I'd... I'm constantly dribbling into my res my reserve tanks all the time. Never had a, a reserve. It was always depleted. Um, irritability. Irritability. We all get a bit irritable at times, but have you ever had it? Like one of my biggest, like one of my key triggers for my depression, um, believe it or not, my PTSD, one of my key triggers is, is um, irritability, noise. Um, now, <clears throat> I can't... I don't like children's noises. I don't know why, and I don't mean it in a horrible way because I've got three fucking children, but I mean the tone that children produce. It it seems to irritate me. It's the high-pitched voices, um, predominantly women, it seems, you know. So I do get very irritable. I get irritable in crowds, and kids have a tone change all the time because their voices are constantly changing. They're on the go, so... They could be to your left shouting and then, you know, a millisecond later they're to your right. So it's really overwhelming when you've got an overcrowded head, which is why I'm very particular about where I go. I'm very particular about who I socialise with, purely because of that fact, because I've been to parties before and I've gone, I'm fucking going home, mate. I'm literally, I've got up and gone, see you later. And it's now become a custom thing. I'll turn up and if I don't enjoy it, I'd walk off because it's overwhelming me. So, you know, when I sit with my friends, I try to manage that, normally through uh, a spout of medication or a muscle relaxer or something like that, to try and keep me triggered, you know, try and keep me able to be sort of kind of socialising without getting irritable. Physical fatigue is one of them, isn't it? Or feeling hopelessness. Absent-mindedness. They're crazy ones, aren't they? But this one I, I research, and... Um, 
It does. This is what I get. Headaches. My change in appetite is massive from when I'm in a bad mood or if I'm in a low mood, I do binge eat. I binge eat on shit. I get angry and go, fuck you, I love six biscuits. I know it's not good for me because I know about nutrition. I've learned about nutrition. I've followed nutrition. I know what it did. I used to do weight training, so I knew the right foods to eat, what not to eat, when to eat. But you can't help that. You can't help but allow it. You know, you can't help but sort of kind of deal with it, you know. Um, but nervousness, though. Nervousness. That's a, that's an absolutely crazy one. Um, that's kind of one of those ones that can... It depends on your personality, I suppose. Um, hold on two seconds. I was just shutting my car, my curtains. The, the light was blinding me. Um, <clears throat> headaches. That's what I get all the time. Migraines. Changing appetite, sorry. Um, is a big one. And then what happens is when you eat and you, you feel low because you feel bloated. Like me at the moment, I feel bloated because last week I had COVID. I was eating, I was still eating and drinking, but I was eating just crappy foods. Just, you know, high energy stuff, sweets, just to try and give me that boost, try and get me through the day. And now, bloated as hell. Absolutely hate myself today. So it's it always, it's a constant. So then you get low again, and then you need that pick-me-up from, say, a friend. Might pick you up. Nervousness is what I was just saying there. Nervousness, that depends on your personality. But I don't really get nervous. Um, I think I sort of kind of overtaken by sort of the confidence side of things but I can understand depending on your background how you're raised nervousness can be quite a big thing because again you might be dealing with all these feelings above and nervousness will just sort of kind of creep in big one here difficulty concentrating horrible there's times where people have been I've been so engrossed in an email and I'm trying to get it right and I know I'm battling with my head and then I've turned around and there's just been noise which I'm normally involved in. I'm normally going, Wee! you know, giving it all the big licks. And then, but when I'm in the middle of the process, instead of just putting the process down and enjoying that, I didn't. I would be like, shut the fuck up. I'm in the middle of an email. You fucking inconsiderate wankers. You know what I mean? And that's how I used to lash out. So then I'm going from difficulty concentrating straight into irritability, straight into anger. And then, you know, that was always followed by a headache because I'm stressed. Do you see what I mean? They just bounce off of each other. Irrational anger. That there it is. Irrational anger. That's what you used to get. What the fuck are you doing, James? You, you're normally involved in this, mate. Normally you're having a good laugh. What are you doing? Fucking shut up. I'm your fucking boss. You know, and that's what you do. Irrational anger. Nobody wants that. That's not my personality. But that's where I was. Sense of dread is another big one, isn't it? Sense of dread. And obviously we're leading into depression it's a horrible thing isn't it um i know i've lived it for for almost 10 years and um luckily i'm battling that now so this is what this is about battling those demons and just having the i, I just want to be left with the ptsd and just might allow myself to deliver and um nurture coping mechanisms for that alone without trying to battle anxiety and depression um anxiety still cripples me sometimes um even though you're I'm quite a confident person. I still get hit with it. And there's certain situations I don't want to get myself into. So, interesting there. They're the, they're the ones that you would feel personally. They're the ones you feel personally. So, I also gave a couple of scenarios that might cause the stress. Because at the end of the day, emotional exhaustion, it, it manifests from emotional exhaustion into stress. And that stress then turns into those those topics i've just spoke about manifests in different ways and ultimately you then if it's that long-term thing like i did you're in depression you're just everything you know and i'm reverting straight back to that stuck trapped feeling that emotional exhaustion you know chronic pain you know it, it's it sort of kind of manifest poor sleep and everything lack of energy all of this is just starts from stress and that could be stress at home could be kids could be a relationship could be a friendship that's upset you you could be at work and for, for example you might not be meeting deadlines at work you might be in a role that you're not confident at doing and you're stressing because again i loop back to the conversation to start the podcast where if you're in a role that you can't confidently do 
you're going to get stressed. That might be a little bit of stress that you can cope with if you've not bigged yourself up too much. But if you picked yourself up a lot, you might be swimming or you might be, you know, looking like a swan on top gliding around. But underneath you're absolutely paddling like a bastard, you know, because you don't know how to get out of it. And it, it, do you are you sort of honest and humble enough to go and say, I need a bit of fucking training or give me a hand? I certainly did this for my role. I walked in and said, I'll do that job, but train me in that specific SME detail. So do that and I'll do the job. So you have to be confident and you have to have that ability to do that. More absences or, you know, you might have <clears throat> high turnover rate, you know, it depends. There might, there's all sorts of contributing factors from work that you have to consider. And when I say like the things that can cause this stress, and I, and I allude to, you know, family, friends, work, could be anything, you know, it could be anything that that, and it could start off as a little tiny you know, a little tiny stress headache, you know, you just got it on the back of the temples or the back of the neck normally is where I get it. I've got two muscles at the side of my spine at the base of my neck and uh, they hurt. They, they've got two little nodules on them um, that have basically manifested from a permanent knot where I've been stressed for so long that they, they said that you're, you've built up almost like a, um, like a cartilage type feeling. It's built up a little, uh, where you've constantly done damage to it and been stressed it's just almost built a like an excess bit of sort of muscle around it which is causing me constant pain and, we, and I mean it, there's not a day I'd, I'd say when the doctor spoke to me the other week and I said to him I just need to sort this my neck out and I said I can I'm living with the depression and PTSD I'm working on that myself I want to get off the medication eventually I gave him all the spiel but you know I said to him I want to get rid of the pain because Every day I'm sat at a six, and that's not even a joke. I wake up at a six pain. And when you're dealing with pain on that level all the time, it's just ha like having white noise in your head to the point where it's actually created uh, tinnitus in both of my ears with the stress. So I'm constantly almost degrading from this. And I put myself... I'm in a lot of scenarios where that just can be at the trigger of a finger, I'm stressed. It could be anything it could be a scenario with a friend it could be the scenario like I've had today and that stressed me how do I relax well I don't I don't know how to relax yet so this is a learning process for me and some of the things that we look for triggers um, and certainly you know when I talk about them all in, as a little bit of a group here to try and give you that sort of insight and that's high pressure jobs you might be in a high pressure job you might be a police officer teacher doctor nurse these are high pressure jobs with a lot of responsibility that might just cause you stress. You might not realise the stress impact until you get into the role. You might work in A&E and not expect it, but shit me. I mean, I <clears throat> remember that, you know, a lot of nurses were complaining when the COVID came out and rightly so, they were put in some really hostile situations. But at the same time, a lot of the medical specialists were saying, well, you've trained for this. This is what you've trained to do. It's like a soldier, you know, you... He's trained in the battlefield, but that might just be on a local range uh, doing exercises with friendly fire and mock-ups. And then all of a sudden you stick him in a war scenario. And, and I've been in that situation when I volunteered for Afghanistan. And I went, I remember being stood in this uh, forward operating base. And, and I remember saying, what the fuck am I doing here? I am 30 or 27 year old. I've got two kids. Um, what the fuck am I doing here? And that's what I saw. And I saw a lot of younger soldiers around me giving it fucking all, getting excited because this is what they've trained for, you know, saving people, hearts and minds, getting really stuck into it. I just wasn't invested. I was like, what the fuck am I doing here? That's where they're coming from. Intense schooling or working long hours, which is what I did, working long hours in a job I hated. And that's where my stress came. In the last two years, it almost broke me. It did break me because I was exhausted having a baby or raising children maybe you've got financial stress maybe the poverty is hitting you at the moment homelessness you might have nothing Christ look at the amount of ex-servicemen that go through a career and have left with nothing at the end and they haven't done they haven't had the financial management and all this other stuff that we get and we learn through life because they've been nurtured to be you know fighting soldiers and then they get dumped in the big world and a lot of them be, end up becoming homeless prolonged divorce proceedings you might have something like that or a death in a family or just living with a chronic illness or injury 
you might actually your injury say for instance i know for a fact that my ptsd impacted my whole family so i've caused stress for them i know i know that i know that now i'm trying to rectify that so i i, I jump on to how to give you a little bit of kind of help as much as i can as well as the other coping mechanisms and all the things i've spoke about in please jump back and listen to any of the stories of you know the the you know the podcasts um, to assist you but I've, I talk about coping mechanism meditation reflection I talk about all these things mindfulness all the time they're all coping mechanisms that will assist with treating this emotional exhaustion that you're feeling before it manifests into you know life-changing stress or depression um, but some of these things just make a lifestyle change try to acknowledge what is causing you this emotional stress look for your own triggers and that's all about mindfulness. That's all about body mapping. Look at your body and go, and, right, I'm feeling that in my neck. Why? I'm squeezing my hands really tight so I can see the, the whites of the knuckles. And I don't know why. Um, or you might be sat there and you're really, your shoulders, I do this all the time. I sit there and my shoulders are literally up in the sky. You know, they're almost become earmuffed for me. And I go, and then I, all, I go, and I can't believe I've held them there. For that long, I must look like fucking Hunchback of Notre Dame. Because that's where I sit. That's my stress levels are in my shoulders. And it's a horrible thing because then you get tension headaches. And this is what we talk about. So we, we need to look for lifestyle changes. We need to body map ourselves. And try and <clears throat> understand, eliminate, excuse me. Eliminate the stresses, you know, as much as we can. Admittedly, you're not going to eliminate your stresses if it's raising children unless you want to uh you know see if you can sell them or, you know whatever you want to do um you might be able to sort of get them out to work get them earning some some cash get them out there um i don't know but you might not be able to remove it but if you can and a lot of these stresses in our jobs we can eliminate straight away shut down clock off when you should be clocking off you get nothing for the extra hours i can tell you that a little bit of cash is not going to pay for your fucking negative health later on in life it's not going to when you're when you're sat on the coffin at fucking sixty five and didn't make retirement because you were dealing high end levels or putting yourself under high stress unnecessary high stress. So switch off your in, yeah switch it off switch your computer off boom that's me I'm done for the day I don't need to do any extra I'll fucking pick it up tomorrow no problems just do your core stuff that can be removed straight away change your job if you have to there's a a multitude of of jobs I've proved it I've joined a complete new job and within a year turned my life around educationally another one this is a big one for me and i hit this hard today and that's eating healthy always always eat healthy yes have a good day sorry have a bad day yes of course we deserve those we're humans we deserve to indulge every now and then but it's about every now and then it's about taking it's about moderation if you eat unhealthy you're just going to put on weight you're going to feel unhealthy you're going to feel sluggish you're not going to want to get out of bed you're not going to want to face the day you're not going to want to change and i can see that and i do that that's why today straight back on slimming world you know straight in with the good stuff fruit shakes waking up and you know really hitting it. and i do already tonight i feel more energy tonight than i did last night and it's you know quarter past nine at night for me exercise big one big one isn't it you know exercise we all talk about raising the endorphins and getting the serotonin levels going you know at the end of the day depression is your body's lack of ability to produce serotonin that's what an antidepressant does it gives you that little tweak to try and change the you know the i think it's the frontal cortex or frontal lobe don't quote me i'm not a fucking medical scientist but it's around that area and what antidepressants do is they your body when you get into a depression state is your body's just stopped producing serotonin so you've you've stressed yourself out that much you put so much pressure on yourself that your body's decided you're just you don't deserve to be happy basically that's what it says you don't deserve to be happy mate fucking slump yourself down antidepressants they give you a trickle of serotonin that's what they do they get you up and out of bed just enough to survive that's what they do they're not a miracle cure they do enough to make you survive. You have to make that change. You have to get out there and eat healthy. You have to exercise. You have to get enough sleep. I talk about these... I've, I talk about the last couple that are in mind 
a lot. And those are things that you can do yourself. They'll give you that spur, that energy. Getting enough sleep, going to bed. Um, that's a really important thing. Get in those eight hours sleep if you can. I mean, I don't. I function on seven at best. Normally six hours sleep. But that's what I function on. Six hours is fine for me. Right, so it's a comfortable It's a comfortable. Uh, time and sometimes I exceed that at the weekends that's when I can really truly relax but one of the biggest things and I talk about this all the time that that can start this process straight away practice mindfulness please practice mindfulness meditation yoga breathing exercises going for a walk getting out amongst nature and do what I'm doing now keep a journal Write down your feelings and thoughts in your journal. Get them off of your mind. How many times have you been sat there at 2 o'clock in the morning and thought, my mind's fucking going crazy. I need to get this off. And the amount of times when I was in a high-stress position, I'd go downstairs at 2 o'clock in the morning and I'd just start writing shit down. And when I came back in the morning and read it, it made no fucking sense. But to me, it was getting it off of my brain. And I'd go upstairs and I'd be like, oh. I can put that to bed. I didn't care what it said, but I can put it to bed and I can go to sleep. And it does work. Keeping a journal is an amazing thing. I think more so as you get a bit older, a bit more mature, you know that you are looking for... It's nice to keep a journal. And I must admit, I bought myself a nice... It's only £11. A nice leather um, handmade uh, book. Uh, You know, it's it's a journal um, with a lovely pen. And I, and I just write down my thoughts that as and when, stuff for the podcast, stuff for my life, how I'm feeling today, just to get them off my mind, reinforce, not try and reinforce the negatives, but if I write a negative down, I always caveat right beside it with a positive. I feel a bit low today, but I'm going to embrace today. I'm going to, so already I'm doing mindfulness whilst I'm writing. One of the most important things for me, and, and I'm, like I say, I'm very fortunate. I, you need to connect with a trusted person friend now i have different levels of what people in my little circle would be probably willing to take at the moment which is quite good to me but ultimately i do have um you know I've, i'm very lucky to have one of the best friends i've ever had and that, and that is the, uh, the person that i've always confided in um and that has basically got me through and so much so that now i look for that now i look for that trait and i've been very lucky to re-engage with the family members. I've been very lucky to meet new people and re-engage with old people. And they all give me that that similar trait. They all give me that trust. I know for a fact I can take, tell them things and, and I know for a fact that it doesn't go past their lips or I'd like to hope so unless I've got character judgment wrong. Um, but it's important to trust people with that. You need someone that you can trust. Um, and what I want to sort of kind of, there's two really big ones, um, obvious ones, which are if you're feeling and you get to the point where none of this has worked and you need that little extra bit, you're too in deep, then meet up with a professional. It changed my life. I, changed, I went to a cognitive, cognitive behavior therapist, I uh, had 38 therapy sessions, and the, the, the wealth of knowledge I got out of Um, those therapy talks talking about my own personal experiences right from being young to to growing up so that she got a full field of of what could trigger this and whether it was ongoing and she was like no genuinely this has been caused by your crashes etc etc but what she did do was she gave me coping mechanisms she gave me confidence to attack this head on I didn't use those coping mechanisms to their full advantage until this year till I was ready I was ready to make that change. I'd had to scare my life, make the change. And obviously, talk to your family doctor. Go to him. You might get prescribed like I did straight away. Um, I, I was on, um, I'm on antidepressants, muscle relaxers, and anti-anxiety medication. And that's what I have to get. Yes, there are side effects that you don't. You do get a bit emotional. Well, you get very emotionless from your, um, you know, from antidepressants and my anti-anxiety tablets because again they're bringing my heart rate down even more. Bearing in mind, I'm taking these two to suppress my heart rate, and my heart rate sits at around about fifty-nine. So, sorry, forty-nine. So when I stand up, 
it's, re- it's reduced my levels so much so that when I stand up, I get a bit lightheaded. So they monitor me every six months. They take bloods and everything else just to make sure that I'm okay. But they might prescribe you with sleeping aids. They might prescribe you with something to just get you going again. But ultimately, one of the biggest things that I find, and I actually make a conscious effort in my mindfulness when I'm doing body mapping and looking at my inner self, um, I, I take a break. And I know now when I'm in work and I'm going, I'm fucking not taking anything in anymore. I'm not acting properly. I'm not, I'm not invested. I'm not engaged. Take a break. Knock a day off and go out and spend the day in the forest. Spend day doing something you like. Go and meet a friend. Have a cup of tea. Have something to eat. Just engage with people. Get out and about. Um... Really, really massively important for me. And I find that mind, that in, is incorporated in mindfulness. It's incorporated in meditation. It's incorporated in just take some music. I mean, music's the food of life. Take some music, put on some nice, soothing music, and just catch up with nature. Smell nature. Enjoy nature. That is the best therapy you can get. You're getting exercise. <clears throat> you're getting um, vitamin D. You're out and about in the in the nature. <clears throat> there's Christ, there's sometimes when I go outside in nature and it's a nice warm day, I'll take the flip-flops off and I'll walk barefoot because walking bare feet on, on Earth's ground, and I'm not talking hippie shit here, but it does. It, it browns you. It's, it's got its own natural healing powers to do that and walk around with bare feet, enjoy nature to its fullest. We do it on the beach. We go on the beach. We run around in the sand. We feel amazing. Until you get onto the shingles, slip over and smash your face. But that's another story, isn't it? I'm going to wrap up. Before I wrap up, though, I'm just going to finish with um, some things to look out for. Maybe you're noticing a friend. Maybe you're, you've noticed a friend that's going this way. Some of these have triggered you a little bit and going, oh, fucking hell, Dave, Dave's a bit like that. I need to maybe engage with him. But have a look for um, things like frequent colds. That's a massive sell, uh, telltale sign of emotional exhaustion if you if you're getting frequent colds or you know frequent breakouts or infections or you know medical conditions that is a a first sign of stress that's emotional exhaustion weight gain insomnia we spoke about that premature aging do you look in the mirror and see yourself aged maybe you're not as relaxed and chilled out as you think you are maybe you are taking stress but you've not body mapped yourself to understand why you're stressed you 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 just you you almost get that we talk that we call it the bury the head in the sand syndrome um you maybe you do maybe you look at yourself and go am i aging am i putting on weight am i sleeping less am i getting colds all the time have i got high blood pressure you're emotionally exhausted mate whoever you are you're emotionally exhausted Look out for anxiety. Does does the person not want to start going places? Or overwhelming depression. Do they feel out of character? These are really important signs. But just remember, emotional exhaustion is the first sign before developing into these and manifesting into these things. So it's a treatable condition. You can just do it by eliminating stress, taking out those stressful events that trigger you. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your family can't take them away but maybe you can address it big things to look at there a couple of good topics there i think um i've enjoyed this actually i got well engrossed in it um thank you for listening and i hope i've offered you some food for thought i hope i've given you maybe some insight maybe you've seen a friend that's dwindling down going down the hill you know and and you, you kind of a bit concerned but didn't really know what the signs were maybe this has helped you out to see those signs if you have then you know reach out connect Make sure they're okay. Um, You'll be surprised how just saying, are you okay, um, can start a conversation. You know, it can start a conversation. It can get that ball rolling. Before you know it, you might find that person that you never thought you had that you can confide in and trust, and they might offer you support. Really, really massively important. Thank you for listening. And uh, I'm super super excited for the next one already. Uh, I love this. I love this. Um... So I'm going to try and organise a live as well this week to try and get some debate on the go with regards to my topics. Um, If not, I'm just going to jump on live and debate them and uh, see who joins in. But uh, yeah, thank you for listening. 
and uh, I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.